Harimai, Harimai, welcome. Welcome to this meeting, both in this room and on Zoom. It's good to see you all here. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Karen, Karen Stacey, aho. Um, you going to talk about your involvement yeah. first? Yeah. Uh -huh. I was asleep and got woken by the phone in the middle of the night in late March 1983, and it was a woman from Granham Common, and she had talked to a Kiwi woman who knew me and knew my phone number. And so she rang me in New Zealand to say, we're having this International Women's Day of Action for Nuclear Disarmament on the 24th of May, and we want to spread it around the world. And can you do something in New Zealand? <laughs> and so that set things in train for me because I had been a supporter of the peace movement, had gone out and protested when there were ships that the US didn't confirm whether they had nuclear weapons on board. So I used to go out to the protest, but I wasn't involved. So this changed that for me. Uh, yeah, and I was also a supporter of other movements um, for change, including on the Vietnam War, which the first time I went and marched absolutely terrified me. Yeah, I was 31, a part-time tutor at university. I was by myself and I had time and I was open. Karen. Okay. Well, in 1983, I was in my mid-30s. I had two children, six and two. One of them's here today. I was a primary school teacher at an inner city Auckland school. Um, I'd always uh, been aware of the futility of war from my family's stories of World War II and also the horror of um, nuclear weapons in Hiroshima. I'd been involved in a few human rights and social justice actions uh, uh, from things like the Home Birth Association trying to establish uh, safe and available home births with, um, when Joan Donnelly was around, equality for uh, women, women's rights. I was part of the 1981 protests and I was at university in Auckland when the anti-Vietnam War protests were happening. I also uh, went up to um, Takaparapa with a, a school teacher from the school I was teaching at, we dashed off after school. I don't know why I was able to do that, but the children were somewhere. And uh, we were there when they were leaving. So that's my involvement and in how I got involved in social issues and movements. Yeah. So we've got a few questions of you. And I'd ask you simply to put your hand up and you might like to just look around the room as I ask these questions. And they're probably questions suitable for the older amongst us in the audience. So have you ever heard of this Women's March? I suppose if you're here, you have. Did you attend? So that's that's around three. Yeah. Um, four. Um, did anybody you know attend? Okay. Um, were you or somebody you know involved in organising it or other activities around it or in the peace movement um, at that time or at some other time? Yes. So that's more hands again. And finally, have you ever been involved in a movement for social change? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I think we forgot to put up our hands ourselves at times because um, I think we could probably say yes to, to most of those. But um, I'm sorry, it's a bit harder to give a flavour for the people on Zoom. So this is simply an indication of what we're covering and we're going to be moving hopefully at the speed of light because we would like to have your comments and queries. So the context, let's jump to peace. And the next one. I think we've forgotten. In the early 80s, there was talk about a nuclear clock. And there was concern that the clock was at about two mid minutes to midnight. That there would um, inadvertently or deliberately be a nuclear war and that life on Earth could be compromised for humanity. Let's face it, the Earth might survive or it might not. 
it's, I don't know enough about the science of that. So even before the First World War and the Second World War, you had conscientious objectives, objectives, and you had women who supported those objectives. After the Second World War, you had groups like the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. You had Quakers. So there were peace groups that came through from way back. And in the six, CND started in the UK in the 50s, in New Zealand in the 60s, and Greenpeace in 1974. And 73 was the year that New Zealand Prime Minister Norman Kirk sent a frigate with a minister on board, Fraser Coleman, up to Muirara to protest against French nuclear atmospheric testing. So we had history in this. After the 75 election, um, Robert Muldoon, the then Prime Minister, welcomed US warships back into New Zealand waters. Um, and so that peace group grew a bit larger. And there were protests by the peace squadron um, and up Queen Street when there were um, ships in harbour because of the US policy of neither confirm nor, or, nor um, deny whether there were nuclear weapons on board. In the late 70s, early 80s, there were also, um, this is before the first big round of local government reform in the late 80s. And so there were lots of small councils. So the Devonport and Mount Eden councils in New Zealand were known to be quite liberal, and they declared themselves to be nuclear free. And increasingly, in, at the beginning of the 80s, other people started to declare their, their homes, their work, places of business to be nuclear free as well. And so that's New Zealand, but also internationally. The women at Greenham Common had a peace camp and people, not just women, protested at that camp ongoing for a very long time. But in English conditions in the north of the UK in winter, it was pretty tough. But women kept womaning those campsites because they were so committed to stopping cruise missiles being destroyed for the reasons that we've discussed. So that was the peace context. The general context was also about a time of change. This was a time when the gap between rich and poor was much less. And I'm sorry, I haven't checked whether the difference in income between them, the, whether it was the average or the median, which is a bit different, between the lowest income group and the highest was five and a half times. I would be very happy if it was still that today. Unemployment benefits, you could live on them. You could, but they were tight, but you could live on them. You could actually be involved in civic community affairs because you weren't discriminated against, because people accepted unemployment benefits and beneficiaries. But there were chain, we were changing times. You'd had the rise of feminism in the 70s and 80s. You'd had a lot of consciousness raising. You had women who could live by themselves. They could leave violent marriages because of the institution of the domestic purposes benefit. And then there were Maori and um, racial and cultural issues. So think the beginning of the Waitangi Tribunal, which was established in 75. Karen's re referred to Bastion Port, Taikaparafa, and um, the demolition of that camp in 79. Think of Donna Awatiri's very radical at the time book, Maori Sovereignty, which caused a lot of friction and angst. And then think also of the dawn raids that go back to 1974, but occurred over a long period, and the Springbok tour in New Zealand that divided the country. I was in a family where provincial sisters were against the tour, their husbands, and often some of, if not all of their kids were pro-tour. It was a really interesting background to be stepping into with something like this. Karen, do you want to see if I'll be talking about those? All right, so now we skip to something more practical. Uh, the technology context, probably most of you, some of you will know what I'm talking about here. There were only landline telephones, right? There were toll calls that were expensive. 
Um, and many of the organisations that uh, were in the community, small groups doing actions, I think back to the Ponsonby Food Co-op, um, uh, that had local phone trees. Anyone belong to a, or remember local phone trees? Yeah. Yeah, five people at the top of the tree would get the news or the, the, the meeting or the time to, to do something and they'd ring five more. And those five would ring five and another five would, and so on until we spread whatever it was we needed to. So you remember? <laughs> there were no mobiles. So we had no instant text, email, social media facilities. Um, it seems incredible, but it's true. No, not many, no computers, uh, photocopiers, ways of printing uh, were um, not available to us. Some people, some women who were part of our um, the group uh, had access to printing facilities from where they worked or um, connections within their family. And some of us had uh, use of gestetners and banders because if we worked at schools or offices. <laughs> what were? <laughs> graphs, yeah. Various ways, but they weren't like today, were they? No. So um, drafting documents, press releases, handouts, etc. cetera, um, we always, you know, that we wanted printed, we had to do ourselves. This affected a lot of what we produced and how we got information out and was, in fact, at first, one of the main challenges, I think, to get information out to women, to people about what was going to happen. So this is just a very quick look at the cover of what I think I was sent by Granham Common Woman. And so the May to the 24th Woman All Out for Peace. And then we're moving on to the next one, Karen. Yep, we're on it. Um, I wrote this out, put it around the university, put it around a few cafes. I don't remember if I put an ad in the Herald. Um, I can't, I just can't remember. But anyhow, the first meeting was to women who might be interested on Wednesday the 13th, 13th of April. And a couple of days before that meeting on the Sunday, Dr. Helen Kildercott from um, the International Physicians Group Against Nuclear Weapons was speaking at the YMCA in Pitt Street. And the place was full to overflowing. And towards the end of the, the presentation, I suddenly thought, you've, you've got a captive audience. You have to get up and say something. And so, thank goodness I did. I didn't expect more than five, eight, ten women at just desserts. I thought one table with six to eight seats would be enough. We had over 30. And in fact, in my, um, in my broadsheet article, I've re referred to 120 people. So there may well have been more, but I'm not clear whether I'm talking about the first meeting in the cafe or Kushla Dodson, who was the manager, director of the YWCA, which had an office just off Queen Street. She volunteered the YWCA for our, what we were going to call, I can't remember what it was, coordinating group meetings on a weekly basis up to the 24th of May. So we had women's organizations coming on side very quickly. And at, the, at that first meeting, those first couple of meetings, we had some peace movement women from CND and Greenpeace and, and other places, but um, and like Quakers and Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. But we had a lot of people who were like us. They had supported the peace movement, but they'd never done anything. And some of them had never protested before. So this was a new experience for all of us. Okay. So we set up this coordinating umbrella group um, and it had quite a few subgroups. I never knew I would not have then been able to name all the women on the subgroups and I definitely can't do it now. And so things would come to the coordinating group. Kushler and I had to be really tight on things because there was so much to do. And, you know, when you're reinventing the wheel, to some extent, we got help, particularly from Elaine Shaw, 
God bless her cotton socks at Greenpeace. She worked there as a full-time volunteer from the early 70s until her death in 1990. She was utterly amazing. She provided a lot of support. Um, but, you know, like, you sort of, you have to learn it yourselves. You can take some things on board. And so we made some mistakes and we did some good stuff. Um, but we saw ourselves as an enabling woman. Māori and Pacifica said, we're happy to help with leaflets. I think they were the ones who also held up their hands and said, we're used to creating stages. We'll um, do the stage for you, which was great. Um, but there were lots of organisations, other women's organisations, specific organisations, church groups, women's groups, kindergarten groups, school teachers groups. We can't tell you. All, but they were extremely diverse. And they were also diverse in their political opinions. Um, they were lesbian and straight, women without children, women with children. So it was women who were Maori and Pacifica, and those like most of us here today, Pākehā women. Um, diverse groups and, and connections. Partners in TV and radio. Um, Romy Cool was a printer. She helped us get our printing done. You know, so these are diverse communities and this wasn't a, um, an organizing group that said, no, you can't do something. It was, yes, go ahead. You know, the Devonport Peace Camp was a very significant activity. So was uh, what the Waiheke Island woman yeah. did as well. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Ready? Yes. I think I'm being moved on, which is just as well. We had a discussion and it sort of came up. I can't remember who it was. It may have been me. It may not have been. Wouldn't it be great if 10,000 women could meet 10,000 other women? Um, in a Herald Personals ad, because at the time, there wasn't much time, a way, many ways to contact other people. So the Personals com column could be read by a lot of people simply because it was very interesting. So we had somebody who said, oh, well, we'll take an advert to the Herald. And um, they tried with 5,000 women, want to meet 5,000 women, and the Herald said, no, no way. So that's what we end up, ended up having published. Um, and I have to acknowledge that the estimates for the day range between, between 10 and 25,000. Now, at the time, well, um, I'll say it now, but I'm jumping out of time. Um, Kushla and I stood at the bottom of Queen Street <laughs> and tried to count on the day. We both had counters. And we had been supposed to have... Um, rows of 10. Uh, rows of 10. There were so many women. Our organisation um, was completely overwhelmed. So it was like, do we try... Or do we just let it go? We had to let it go. It was not going to work. The lines were bigger than 12. They, there were so many women. They were moving fast because they wanted to get out of the hubbub of all the women in QE2 Square and at the bottom of Queen Street. You know, it was, it was crazy. So um, we can't tell you with any accuracy what it was. But actually, in retrospect, when I think of um, the USS Texas um, demonstration in August 83, which was put at between 50, 75, 80,000. I think we were well over 25,000, but anyhow, that's another story. Mm -hmm. So I'm uh, glad I kept the personal column. <laughs> I'm very glad Karen kept the personal column. She has been a keeper of the treasures. <laughs> it's called hoarding, I think. Um, this is just one of the examples of advertisements and um, they, this one is called an advertisement. So A4 sheets that were spread around, put up, passed around. And this said on it, this advertisement has been prepared by WAND, Women Acting for Nuclear Disarmament. Now, what's really interesting about this one is it says this advertisement is sponsored by, and I, it's the only example that we found in the treasure trove of... Um, any kind of sponsorship. And it's really interesting. It's well-known Auckland figures like Barbara Goodman. Um, I have, I can't uh, name all of them in terms of time, but uh, different bookshops like David's Bookshop, Dorothy Butler Limited, uh, Gaia Demolition, 
Hardware and Garden Supplies Limited, and one in little quotes, two ordinary blokes, which I don't know whether was a, a hardware handyman <laughs> or just two people who wanted to be known as two ordinary blokes. But um, it's just a little bit unusual and quite interesting that there must have been some other sponsored. I don't know if anyone knows where this one came from. We wondered if it was Devonport or... Anyway, never mind. Right. <laughs> Just interesting. Right, this one. Now, this is um, a photograph of me in 1983, and here I am with my children. And one of the things that I was going to talk about is just how different women were able to contribute in uh, the ways that they could, you know, within their limitations. So fortunately for me, it was the school holidays two weeks before Tuesday, the 24th of May, which is quite convenient. So I was able to contribute in my own way by handwriting information on posters, um, having working groups at my home where we designed the layout for the handout on the day, and also was able to deliver and distribute um, the material. So if you look at me there, I've got a big brown paper package under my arm. I was taking, on my right arm, I was taking the um, posters to the Denport Peace Group and on the day that they also had a creative workshop for children. So you see, it's combining everything that you can do. And also, I think that must have been the day that I attended the vigil outside the Navy base. Did anybody else get involved with that? Yeah, we, we stood in a line. There was lots of singing and then silence. But um, yes, so that came this um, actual picture comes from Lisa Prager's um, uh, movie or film, I should say, Woman on the Move Umbrella Films. And it um, was a still that Renee helped me take when the library had it on display in the room next door. Well, I don't know what you call it there, the ephemera <laughs> room. So I just thought I'd include it because you can see their badges and also um, the children. Okay. I also forgot to say thanks to all the people who helped me with babysitting at that time as well. Yeah, got stretched a little bit. Now, this um, are these uh, the handout that we eventually gave out on the day. I think some people did. There were so many women there, but um, you can see the design symbol. This was the drafting with the pen, pen and pencil on the left hand side, <clears throat> and what it eventually turned out like. And as you know, common to use pen and pencil even today, but it easily gets changed into a computer file. You can send it to everybody. You can have an open file. People can contribute. You don't have to sit around a room discussing what's going to be included and what's not. And why I've included these pages is just as examples to show you sitting there scribbling in my uh, little sun porch, sun room, uh, with all the different handwriting for different people. And this one in particular I like because it's, you can also vaguely see the different colours. And oh, there was one thing I was going to point out in the last uh, slide. We've got up there, we asked the New Zealand government to, and Kathleen and I on reflection, it might have been thought by other people, we should have really said we demand. Yeah, It should have been stronger rather than the you know little woman coming to ask. But there we are. That's how it ended up at the time. That's what it was, and there's that one there. Um, this is another um, thing I was able to do, of course. I'm on one of Claudia. Thank you, Claudia, for coming today. Claudia is. I yes. spelt it right there on the front. On the front, I spelt it incorrectly. There's a story about my spelling. I might even include it today. Um, this one here, I would sit at the kitchen table and just write furiously just the information, March up Queen Street, you know. And the reason that we didn't have those printed on the poster was because when Claudia produced them, we left that space at the bottom for information that we might need. So lots of busy little bee work. Um, I thought that you might quite like it, these headlines. The, um, the Auckland Star... This was the day before, and I like to read it out loud. Peace people are on the march. And it isn't only the trendy lefties. The, the, the newspaper was both positive and assisting, 
by um, the days before, there were a lot of headlines, women poised for nuclear protest, things like that, that um, helped keep the, the um, information bubbling. And, and then, of course, there's, I don't know if the next one's the, no, it isn't. I think, yes, it is. The Auckland Star, and Kathleen will refer to this later, but the Auckland Star, you probably all remember, was an evening pub publication, afternoon publication. So look at the date. They had it out on the day. That white flower woman brings city to a stop, and there we all are. So um, that was they got their scoop before the rest. <laughs> right. So examples of early action, we've got two. And the first one is the woman at the Devonport Peace Camp climbed up Takaranga, Mount Victoria, before dawn to welcome in the Day of Action, this International Day of Action. No, that's Mount Victoria on Devonport. And um, then they went back down. I presume they had breakfast and came across on the ferry. All right. And that, this is what we did. A group of about six of us um, went up to the um, Auckland Army headquarters in Great North, Great North Road. Familiar to some people? Yeah. And there was a huge Macarpa tree outside there. And it felt quite a special um, start to the day to get together this way, just a small group. And, and to just sort of focus on the beginning. And we put the um, woman's armband around the tree uh, in crepe paper. Kathleen on the left, and is it the- uh, Lynn Cowan on the, on the right, and I'd love somebody to be able to tell me the name of the woman in the middle. There were at, at least two other women, Sue and Sally Abel, who had taken me to the army headquarters, but they'd had to leave by then. No one? Oh, we'll, 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 yes. We don't know. I'm not <laughs> sure. I'm not sure. Okay. okay. Thank you. But just something unseen, not part of the hurly burly of the thousands. Just us starting off. Now we we move on to um, the events of the day, and the kestrel arriving down downtown at the the terminal, decorated the ferry. Anyone involved in being on that? Yeah. No, not today. Okay, the singing, the balloons, the creativity of the peace camp. And I felt like it as they, they pulled in there, the, the sign, the beautiful sign, you can cuddle kids with nuclear arms. The balloons covered over the you can't cuddle children with nuclear arms. But you can see the, how effective it was. And it felt to me like with the singing and their arrival, it was definitely a joyous here we are statement. Yeah. And following on from that, uh, the, the first action of the day then, the, the um, women arriving and continuing with their singing and joining the group in QE2 with their cranes and white flowers, sorry? Yes, yes. We, we mentioned both Gil Hanley and um, Marty Friedlander because we've used both of their material here. And um, so they went to QE2 Square, and um, that's where I mentioned the numbers were simply overwhelming. But what I found fascinating that night, at the end of the day, I went back with somebody to their place to watch Eyewitness. And there was a photo of me and Kushla Dodson standing at the bottom of Queen Street talking to one another. And they don't refer to Kushla, who was crucial to what happened. They only refer to me, and they possibly because of that navy blue coat, who knows? But they referred to me as the general reviewing her troops, which I thought was highly ironic given what we were there for. But you know, that's what the media can be like at times. I had gone down Queen Street by myself, I'd got to QE2 um, Square, as I said, couldn't find members of the coordinating group, saw some of the marshals, but couldn't find most of them. So um, I just thought that was, I'd throw that in there. <laughs> so here, here we are, um, the march. This one is uh, probably mid, mid Queen Street. I don't know if you remember these photographs. Um, I, I arrived, I don't know, Kathleen, if you're going to talk about it, I arrived 
um, from the other end of Queen Street and was walking down there. The marshals wore uh, the white armbands with the word marshal on. Very effective we were too in controlling everybody. Um, <laughs> the women were, work were walking all over the uh, road and parked cars, it was di difficult for them to move. And everywhere, just a sea of women and uh, banners, songs, singing or chanting, you know, the spontaneous chanting where someone would start a chant and others would just carry on with that one for a while. Many with white armbands and also with white flowers. Now, I had difficulty getting right down to Q QE2 Square. That's where the marshals were meeting up with um, Kathleen and Kushler. Um, it, it didn't actually happen the way it was <laughs> dreamt up or supposed to. Um, I managed to see a couple of the marshals, so I could see the square, but we decided to um, stay on the footpath slightly apart for a while because it's a little bit higher on the footpath, and it, it gave us the idea we were looking at what people were doing and trying to count. But um, we spread out along the edge of the road, and so much of the march headed off up Queen Street. Here we are, are again um, after Wellesley Street. We only used one side of the road. Kathleen, we were asked to do that, is yes, that correct? I think it was Wellesley, not rather than Victoria. And they needed to be able to get some traffic through. Um, so, and of course, I really felt for the people in the parked cars down Lower Queen Street because if they'd left them for half an hour and the road got closed, they were stuck there for several hours. And also you can see that I've actually got a pointer. Let's see if I can, there we go. Um, along the front, the people that are, um, sorry, that have their backs to us, they're, they're walking backwards, the, me the media press getting their pictures. So from the front of the, the um, thing. I actually felt quite strange standing um, on my own. A lot of the women were with friends and groups of people. And what happened, the marshals got spread out for whatever they were doing. Yes? I've just detected above woman four the sign Woolworths. Yeah, that's Woolworths. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, a bit, bit strange standing on my own after all that. Um, what Alone with the crowd. Uh, I don't know if anyone else went by themselves and felt that or you felt quite connected. But for me, it was a contrast to the weeks of working <laughs> so closely and so hectically with everybody else to be so thrilled at the turnout, to be so um, amazed and overwhelmed, but to be just there in a sort of way sort of isolated from the feelings that go with sharing that with, with friends. Um, yeah, this one's um, Marty Friedlander um, photograph in Artia Square. So the square quickly filled with women and they were crowding into the square. It was difficult. I don't know who remembers this. Difficult to find a place in the square. The women, women were on the packed into Queen Street as well. And so it, we had to wait a while. It took a long time for the marchers to eventually reach the square and once again I was supposed to head to the stage and meet other members of the coordinating group and we'd sort out what was happening well um, of course I'd been counting as women had been going past so I got up there quite late I get to the stage and the Maori and Pacifica women were all there as agreed um, I was the only member of the coordinating committee and we realised there were some vital things that we hadn't actually organised. So we had the speakers, but we didn't actually have, you know how you have a, a meter and greeter and continuity person announcer? We didn't have anybody like that. And it was like, oh, what do we do? And somebody suggested Grace Robertson, for which I was highly thankful because they said, oh, she's used to talking to big crowds. So we thanked her and she did it. And she did a really good job, and it was difficult. And one of the key reasons it was difficult is because of the fact that as a coordinating committee, as I said before, we hadn't spent the time talking about different views of peace and nuclear disarmament and different connections that people make. And so it was a predominantly, as I said, white crowd. 
And when we had the speakers, it was clear that there was far more enthusiasm and respect for the, um, the Helen Clark and I think the Māori Leadbeater. Um, but we also had Mira Zazi from um, the Māori Women's Welfare League. We had Mary Taylor and Hilda Hawkyard Harawira from PANAC. We had Betty CEO from Pacific Phono. They had a harder time of it because people did not, some people, some women, did not want to hear about an alternative view towards peace in terms of a nuclear-free and independent Pacific. And my key regret of the day is that we had not thought to frame it the way it was framed more often after that at times, I think, in terms of you're going to hear a range of views, you're going to agree with some of them and disagree with some of them, but let's be respectful of everybody. So that's my key regret for the day because um, some of the Māori and Pacific women had it hard. Um, I had the easy job that day. Um, my name was on all the posters around Auckland, but it was also in the information that was given to people around the country. So till quite late the night before, and from very early that morning, I had been herding, uh, fielding calls from around New Zealand about um, this is what we're going to do today around the country. And that's what Karen's going to talk to about now. You want me to know? Oh, you want me Oops. to start now? No, there's a bit more. <laughs> I'm forgetting. I'm sorry. Um, I will be talking about that. I should also mention the Pacific Peace Band, which had been at the Devonport Peace Camp, all, also performed, and they were just amazing. We had some lovely uh, performers, and there was also a web at Aotea Square. I'm forgetting this is about the day in Auckland. Um, so the last part. The... The Aotea Square naturally died down, and then an advertised march in single file going down Queen Street had been put out on the posters, and I enjoyed joining that, because single file holding a candle going down Queen Street in silence at five o'clock. By then, the New Zealand star with that stunning headline that Karen showed you before, was out on the streets. People were buying the papers. And we were walking down. We were catching the ferry, going across to Devonport and walking up Taikaranga, Mount Victoria, as the ending of the day. And for me, it was just a beautiful ending. And for the woman at the Devonport Peace Camp, it was returning to where they'd started the day. So it was a really lovely thing to do. And now, Karen. No, I, I was um, sorry that I missed the candlelight march, but I went home happy. I don't know how I went home. This is one that memory is a wonderful thing when you get <laughs> to a certain age. Did I have the car? Did I walk? Did I get the bus? I don't know how I got there and I don't know how I got home. But I um, was sorry I missed the candlelight march, but I was happy to go home. Uh, knowing that it had been, in terms of numbers alone, such a successful um, protest march and peaceful and reached across just so many uh, different groups of women. It was wonderful. So, Kathleen, I think you were talking okay. about the Wellington. So in Wellington, the Ministry of Defence at the time um, was on a corner on Lampton Quay in a side street and around a 1,000 women there um, linked arms outside and encircled the building as much as they could. And they also put up photos of children and flowers and things to show the humanity behind war. That was, that was the intent. And they had to contend with certain things dropping out ministry or defence windows. Um, that should not have been dropping out on people who were undergoing lawful activities. Anyhow, Karen, over to you. Yeah. Um, so just just a few. We could have gone on for a long time. Um, uh, Wanganui and Blenheim both had, uh, actually I might have that in a different place, but that's right, bread not bomb stalls. I'm not going to tell you about all the actions, but just some sort of, um, idea they in Blenheim the gathering of women and children on the village green 
and a walk through the town with balloons to protest uh, the weapons of mass destruction and to celebrate life. Now, um, Nelson and Whangarei, also you can see the actions there, a group of women um, getting together. Remember those steps in Nelson? I think it goes up to the church. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also in Whangarei. So we got we got um, some of the pictures from Broadsheet were able to be used. And also there were um, the other towns that we heard about were Apotiki, Hoki, Anga, Palmerston, North, Whakatani. I mean, probably lots and lots. And Kathleen, I think you need to um, say what you didn't say about being on the stage, about you, when you were speaking, what oh, happened. Yes, I did completely forget that. So because I've got all that information from around the country, when I... I went up to the front of the stage because I thought, oh, well, people might be interested in what was happening elsewhere. And each time I mentioned what was happening in another place, there'd be a huge cheer. And it was like, oh, my God, I've never spoken to a crowd like this before. And, and they're cheering. And I didn't, you know, it's sort of like, you're not ready for it. I, I wasn't expecting it. But it was amazing and also overwhelming. Yeah, but there was a lot. One of the places that we don't, we haven't got in here is Christchurch, but it was also a place that was very active from a, a peace movement point of view. So I don't think we've captured ev everything by any measure. Just a flavour, I think, of yes. Yes, women yes. all over um, in, the in the different towns and areas. So we're moving on now. Oh, sorry. Yes, a little bit out of order, but there you are. There's some examples of Dun um, Wanganui and yeah. Dunedin. The sorts of things that we be, um, became aware of and, of course, researched from Georgia. So the impacts, well, it, it got um, more women, uh, the impacts, sorry, um, it got more women involved in the peace movement. And there were already, you know, some of the key people in the peace movement I've already mentioned were women. Uh, but this added to um, women, and it put new energy into local peace groups, like the group that my sister and her friends started in the eastern suburbs kept going. That was replicated around local peace groups in Auckland. That started up um, for the 24th of May and kept going. WAND kept going, but in a much smaller way. Um, I stayed in it until I left Auckland in the middle of 86. It really reinvigorated the Auckland Peace Forum, which was the sort of coordinating group for all the peace groups in Auckland. And it really helped build momentum for a nuclear-free New Zealand. And I mentioned the USS Te Texas visit in August. And I, I also wonder whether it was just another thing that gave women more confidence about being visible and out there and feeling safe. You know, holding the, the march in the middle of the day and doing actions in the middle of the day was so that, you know, women at home and women at work, everybody could come. Women with children too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they took their and children. The next one? The next one. So... I think it was really effective because we accepted all help and women could choose what and how they did stuff. Okay, you, you might never go near a coordinating group or a subgroup, but you could still do stuff. Um, I've, I've talked about my learning around having respect for a range of views. Uh, there's also the whole question of a, a short-term um, focus and a long-term campaign. This was a short-term focus during a long-term campaign, but because of its success, it really built that momentum. Um, one question that I have, Robert Muldoon was very attached to nuclear warship visits, so that gave Labour an easy focus for the 1984 election, particularly given the way in which Mr then Mr Muldoon um, brought that election about. So did the nuclear issue mean that there was less focus on Roger Douglas's economic agenda in that election? Because that's something I would have to say I'm still very mixed about. And the relevance today, we're nearly at the end. Don't rush, you're fine. <laughs>
nothing gets handed to you on a platter. And I still occasionally watch TV. And there is, I think it's a Steinlager ad. Uh, and it has these very stationary fl like flotilla a of peace groups, boats in the sunshine on a flat sea in the Pacific. I know people who went up to the Pacific to protest against um, nuclear tests. They had three to four months and uh, on very limited but nutritionally okay um, food. Uh, they often were in extremely bad weather. They were extremely lucky if their clothes were simply, and their bedding was simply damp rather than completely wet. They went through lots of storms that, you know, protests have to often occur at the same time as tests or around the same time. So they didn't get to choose when they went up. I would have loved it if corporates had sponsored something like Nuclear Free New Zealand before it became a reality and supported the peace movement. But actually, the lesson I learnt from that ad is you can try and lay claim to it after it's sort of part of the New Zealand accept, accepted doctrine, but you can't take it completely out of context. The people who want that have to keep their eye on the ball and keep going, and that requires quite a lot. This today is different, different times, different technologies, different approaches. Mm. But one of the things that gave us confidence was the enabling um, focus and the confidence from meeting face to face and working together. I've got a couple of things I want to say about war, peace and climate change. We as a first world nation and most first world nations have not had to deal with war on our shores or on our lands since the Second World War. That is not true of a lot of the third world. That is where a lot of the superpowers, proxy wars and other wars have been fought. The only time we have had wars in countries predominantly white, uh, I think um, the old Yugoslavia after it broke up and now the Ukraine. As far back as the 1950s, President Eisenhower was concerned about the role of the industrial military complex and corporate co capitalism, though he might have used different terms. That is still an issue today, particularly with AI. And let's note, it's the United States, Great Britain, the Soviet Union and China who block international efforts to get con effective controls on AI. And let's also remember that the military and wars are not counted in terms of their impact on climate change. The US military is the world's largest single consumer of oil. Its military budget is 28 times larger than what it intends to spend on climate change. Corporate capitalism, well, war makes sense. It's a good time to test your products and create new products and sell more weapons. In New Zealand, and possibly is this in part a response to the really hard time New Zealand politicians, particularly Labour politicians, got after New Zealand became nuclear free. Is that why Labour now appears unwilling to cross the United States? We are now spending 20 billion on making sure that our forces are interoperational with US forces. Andrew Little, the Minister of Defence, recently announced further military spending to transform New Zealand's passive humanitarian defence force into an offensive combat ready zone. Now, that humanitarian defence force becomes even more important, both within New Zealand, given the impacts of climate change that we've seen this year, and in the Pacific, an area that we have played a role in and been part of for over 
well, a very long time. The last point. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. The age and safety of nuclear weapons. If you want to hear about that, a lot of nuclear weapons are now over 80 years old. There's questions about their safetiness and their effectiveness. And if you're interested in that issue, I suggest you listen to Alex Wellerstein being, being interviewed on Radio New Zealand on Sunday, the 19th of September this year. Okay, there's just one part that we um, have always finished with, of course, is our thanks. Our thanks to um, all who helped us get here today. So you can imagine it goes quite a long way back. But um, And thank you all on Zoom and here for joining us. It's, it's so rewarding to... Um, yeah, see you all here. But thank you for making the effort to come. So we were helped by the, the Auckland Library ephemera collection. Um, Renee has been really helpful. Uh, we've been helped by Broadsheet and PeaceLink documenting things and by the New Zealand Herald and the New Zealand Star. Um, Aka Carol's Karen's filing system. <laughs> or um, lack of. <laughs> um, and We've been helped by um, Claudia Pond Ely's At The Time and now reusing um, your beautiful, beautiful artwork and Marty Friedlander and Gil, Gil Hanley, who both did, I mean, Gil Hanley did hundreds of shots of this day, you know. Um, there are so many people who helped make this day possible, including, you know, a, a number of firms that were were more blokey firms than um, female firms, kind of, if you know what I mean, but also by female firms, firms like Caroline Fashions, you know, like there were lots of women who helped in lots of different ways. Mm -hmm. So thanks to all of them and thank you for coming and feel free to let people know that this is up online if you think it's, it's um, worthwhile others seeing.